Hello, everyone. Welcome to Canadian Music in the 80s and 90s and more. A, uh, the YouTube channel and the Facebook group. I'm very happy to be joined by one of my favorite Canadian artists, Mr. Barney Bentall. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate your time. Well, you're welcome, Alan. Good to good to be doing this. Yeah. Um. Well, I want to talk about a lot of things. Um. The one thing I've always been more impressed, very impressed about your career is that you're still doing it and still writing great music. Um, and I, you know, I'm hoping more people give it a chance. Um, I met you a few years ago in Waterdown at a, I think it was a True North Records um, thing. And I picked up this as you, I don't know if you can see it, but you signed it for me. Oh, I uh, sure do. Yeah. 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 Um, do you amazing. like to go by Al or Alan? What's that? Do you like to go by Al or Alan? Either, either or. I've okay. been called worse. <laughs> yeah. We've um, all been called worse. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I I I was really impressed to see you there. Um, it's, it's it was great to see you in such an intimate venue too. Like I mean, it was just a very relaxed performance. You know what I mean? It was. Yeah. You really you really got to sit and listen to your music and really focus on it and um obviously it made me buy your new cd at the time and i loved the cd um and you got to work with your son on it um and i know you worked with kendall carson who i've really become a fan of over the past few years being with alan doyle and i've seen her with spirit yeah. of the west a few times yeah um so when did you sign on with true north records um well I'd say in about 2006, maybe. So okay. it's, you know, when I think about it, it's getting close to 20 years. Wow. Because when I, was, I took a bit of a hiatus and was ranching, 2000, 2006, mm -hmm. I'd left Sony uh, Music and and um, then quickly, because my manager was Bernie Finkelstein in the mm -hmm. early days of the career and who started True North Records. And, and, and you know, and it was now... I mean, it's 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 a wonderful label and it's done so much for Canadian music. So it seemed like a natural fit to go there. Yeah, they definitely have done a lot for Canadian music. And it's uh, I, I had no idea they were based out of Waterdown, Ontario, which is actually yeah. something because, uh, you know, I would think they'd be based out of Toronto or Vancouver or something. Well, like I mean, that. they were based out of Toronto for a long time down in right right there in the Much Music building. That's okay. where they originally were. And they were distributed by Sony. But then when um, when Jeff Kulowick bought it, you know, I think he lived out in that area. And, and you know, there's a certain, you, you no longer had to be associated with, you, you didn't have to be downtown anymore. I mean, it's right. more to have the real estate where it's a lot more affordable. And uh, and I, I totally understand it because I am I am a bit of a rural person myself. Right. Right. Okay. Y'all, I just got to get my power cord. I'll be right back. Sure. Get in. Get in the A on the computer. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So anyways, we're back. Where are you hanging your hat these days, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I'm on Bowen Island. Just um, on the, there in the ranch. In the, in the caribou so going on and we look right i'm looking out at vancouver it's uh across the big body of water which is really nice now like i was saying at the beginning you you are still keeping quite busy with recording and playing shows um what have you got on the go right now like it's nuts i i <laughs> i'm um this month I just finished 10 gigs in 11 days. It's been a long time since I've done that. But I do, I have this trio with Sherry Elric and, and Tom Taylor, who is uh, the front man for the great band, kind of jam band, She Stole My Beer. And so the three of us have did three shows. And then we also have a bluegrass band called the High Bar Gang that's also on True North Records. Okay. Nominated for two Junos. We just did a tour across BC of theaters in BC. And then uh, I do three more um, Sherry, shows with Sherry and Tom. And then I go to Kugluktuk in the Arctic. Wow. Uh, very Northern community there where we're going to, we're going to finish recording a song with some of the 
people up there and uh, of the community and and uh, bringing some musical instruments to the school up there. So uh, that's 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 happens and then I come right back and I go to New Zealand. I I host these oh. trips for Canada's Great Kitchen Party with Jim Cuddy. So that's oh, yeah. Yeah, you've worked with Jim Cuddy and his band quite a bit, or members of yes. his band. Yeah. Um, I remember you saying that when I saw you in Waterdown a few years back. Um, are you planning on doing any more extensive touring across Canada? Uh, well, I I playing all the time. I I, uh, I don't get out to Ontario as much as I probably should, but um, I'm doing uh, doing three or four shows. One at the Horseshoe show Horseshoe in August. Uh, with uh, it's good, great. I'm gonna use Devin Cuddy's band. They're gonna play with me. Okay, that's which is gonna be fantastic. So, what's the material gonna be? Is it stuff? Well, it'll written? be you know what? It'll be a bit of the new stuff, but you know a lot of the old stuff. I mean, when when we started the conversation earlier, that uh, you know, I I love create keep continuing to create music and and make records. It's a bit of a strange task these days because it's so different from where it was when I, when I started in the 80s but right. but um I uh yeah I I I love making the fact that I make new music and can go out and, and play that makes me appreciate the old stuff all the more you know so I, li I like the combination well I remember when I I met you in Ontario um by the way, I should let you know I live in Charlottetown, PEI now. By the way. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, I mean, so I, there's a bit of a time difference between us right now. Yeah, so yeah. I'm yeah. just looking at your clock. What is that? Ten after three, where you are? Ten after three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, I'm four hours ahead of you. So. And it's beautifully, it's beautifully sunny. You can see out there, and there's the ocean. So you're you're near the ocean too. So. The other um, one. The other one. Yeah, yeah. The other one. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um. I remember asking you because one of my favorite albums that really, I mean, your debut album really got me hooked on your music, but um, your second major label, um, Lonely Avenue, was probably one of my personal favorite albums. Like, I, I, and I remember I asked you to play a song for me from it, and you were like, I haven't played that in years. Um, was it, what was it? Was it Don't Talk About Yesterday or one of those? No, it was actually kind of a deep cut. It was uh, nothing hurts like the words. Oh the one yeah, love. okay, yeah. Like I've always loved that song. Um, yeah, yeah. But I'm guessing you probably haven't played it in quite some time. Yeah, I haven't played it in quite some time. But we were just going over. We're playing um, the legendary hearts. I mean, we still play. Oh really? The Commodore show. Uh, that's the big, big club where everybody plays here in Vancouver. We're doing that at the end of March. So. We're we're actually just kind of going through all the songs and pulling out ones we haven't played in a while. Yeah. So, is it hard when you have to go back and pick a song you haven't done in a while? Like, does it really challenge your chops or? Not really. Like, I'm I'm just doing music all the time. Probably the only thing, and I really worked hard on this, but the only thing is there's a couple of songs that are high in yeah. In, register and and you know i've worked i've really looked after myself but mm -hmm. you've lost a little a note or two maybe but i've never wanted to go down um you know some bands i know i won't mention them and and i i don't it doesn't bother me at all but some of them start tuning their guitars down to, to right um drop things a, a semitone or a tone and and um so far i haven't had to do that but but there's there's certain songs that are pretty darn high Right. That's just, that's the nature of, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of almost an athletic thing as, as much as, yeah, you can't, can't, you're going to lose a note or two. I also remember in your early career, um, I did a bit of, I was really covering the much music documentary that came out and went across the country. I don't know if you saw the screening of it or not. No, um, I didn't. Cause much music I thought really, gave you a lot of coverage and that's how I got to know your music. I remember seeing uh was it, it was a big ticket special. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it was the Diamond Club in Toronto. Well it yeah, was the Diamond right. Club at the time. Yeah, you got a good memory. Yeah, because I remember being just so enthralled with that. Like I it, yeah it that's showed cool. you guys were a great live band and I was like wow what an awesome band. I just wish I was old enough to get into the Diamond Club to go <laughs> see that at the time, but I wasn't. Um 
but yeah, you're, I remember you're grateful I, now because if you were old enough then, you'd be older than you are now. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I we were a great live band. There's there's they in our in our peak, you know. I I I remember Colin Linden, I think, saying that you know he just felt like we were one of the best touring bands in Canada. It just we had a great feel. Yeah, I just I I was always amazed at how I I was amazed at how great you sounded live, and I think Lonely Avenue it just came out at the time. Yes, when you did that special, but I um that's when Much Music was actually doing some pretty cool stuff. I like the yeah, way they it used really to. was. You know, it was, I don't know how I, it, it, you know, sometimes we look back and we felt like, and justifiably so that the record companies weren't exactly giving us the best deal in the world, but, right, and, you know, so we, we were, we felt, you know, that could have been different. But when I look back at it now, we were in the golden age. We actually were in the best time I think ever where, you know, as, in, as far as being a Canadian band, when we got signed to Sony, there was only five domestic acts, and two right. of them were Loverboy and Celine Dion, and Larry Gowan, I think, in Heart Rouge, which was a, a, a sort of a French Canadian type right. band, and ourselves. That was it. So we we just got so much attention, and from that label, and we were really, uh, yeah, we were very very lucky. I really thought much music did a lot to help Canadian bands back then. Did they ever? Like, I mean, they, they, they almost created a superstar system of Canadian bands because they lumped your videos in with everything. Like you'd see the top hits for coming from the States and Europe, but you'd also see you guys mixed right in the middle of it. And it made me think, Oh, these guys are right up there with everybody. Yeah. It's so true. Al, because the, the, uh, you know, you George, there'd be a George Michael video and then a Blue Rodeo video and yeah, you know, ZZ Top and then us, you know, like it did in and it was a different time in that when we would put out a record, everybody, people I knew, friends are walking down the street, people would know within weeks that we'd put out a record. And nowadays, nowadays you can run into somebody that'll go, well, I mean, in a real cruel sense, they they might have thought you died. Yeah. Or they thought like, what are, you know, like, uh, do you still play or do you still tour? And I go, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm very busy doing what I'm doing play, and playing music, and, but people don't know, you know, like it's, yeah. it's, it's, it was different. There was a limited amount of bands. It was finite for sure. Yeah. And the, the ones we got all that attention on much music and it created a, so there was a, a real strong radio presence, FM radio presence. Right. If you were lucky, you got on AM, I guess. But there was, there was um, the FM radio presence coupled with much music, and it created a, you know, you really, you, you, it it was so impactful for touring and selling records and making a living. I I mean, for me, I think it was it was. Right around 1988, I thought it was a really exciting time for Canadian music. Like, I mean, you guys came out with your debut. Colin James bursted onto the scene on his. Jeff Healy came out, and it really made me excited about Canadian yeah. music. And I really thought, you know, Canadians are just as good as anybody else, if not better yeah. than yeah. what's out there. Like, I mean, because I mean, we really did have a superstar system. I mean, Tom Cochran was getting big still. Um, it was such, and Blue Rodeo obviously kept going, and the Tragically Hip were coming up, and it was just, it was great to see so many Canadian bands getting airplay on much music and on radio. Yeah. Um, so I have to take back, um, I have to go back to your early career. Obviously, I had to bring this out. Yeah. Um, yeah. this was your major label debut. How long had you been making music before you got signed? Like um, for a while before well you... you know it's funny we actually got a record deal um in 1979 really uh, on AM records but we we're we we're uh, i was going under the name brandon wolf at that point but we got signed to a m the same time the paolas did okay and um <clears throat> so we we had that that happened and then 
we lost that deal. I mean, we were just too green. We needed right. it. And then, and then we formed a band called the Revengers, mm -hmm. which was, uh, which was great. I mean, it had two of the guys from three of the guys from the legendary, or all of us. We, we, it was a four piece, but then we got a keyboard player and we became the legendary hearts. So we, we learned a lot from playing that band. We did a lot of covers. We did our own songs and we just kept working in the studio. And then, and then by the time we got signed in 1988, that we, we were, we, we felt like we knew we could, we could handle it. I mean, it was funny. Whenever I look back at those times, there is no, there, there's no mentoring. There's no buddy saying, okay, this, you're going to, this is going to be, if you all of a sudden start having success, you go from, from a, like we, we were a successful club band in Vancouver. Yeah. You know, like any given week downtown Vancouver and Gastown and, and the surrounding areas, there were these great clubs and you'd have, you know, Colin James would be playing, Katie Lang would be playing, we'd right. be playing uh doa would be playing oh, wow. it, it was like when i look back at it it's nuts and 5440 was starting like it was mm -hmm. all there was there was that was happening um but uh it was it was you know yeah where was i, I was going it was gonna i thought it was gonna be able to circle back to my that's point. okay that's uh, okay i like you time. I actually um, wanted to ask you about some of the bands you would have, you know, um, run into and been around a lot back in those days before you got signed and even after you got signed, because I knew you were good friends with Spirit of the West. Well, they, um, when I first, I mean, Jeffrey and I are, were doing this Ranch Writers record, the second one, right. which, uh, you know, we got a record deal for it, the first one, and it's, it was great. It was, it was, it was fantastic. And, and uh, when I look back, he, uh, John Mann and my wife and Jeffrey's wife went to theater school together. That's how we all got to know each other. And Jeffrey was a heavy duty um, truck mechanic, like a <laughs> transmission mechanic. Yeah. We would just hang out and then, then you know, like they found out they started playing. They were, they were playing and then they would go, we had a studio. So we weren't signed yet. We, we, yeah, we weren't signed where I made their first record it was all happening around the same same time. Then you know that I I produced their first record, right? And, uh, and so we were just all friends. And then you know same with same with call. It was funny. Spirit of the West and ourselves were that that was really close. I look back, it, it's it's kind of crazy because we were competitive and we were we. It was as if we thought only one person's going to get a record deal. Like right. we were all we were all impacted, heavily impacted by Brian Adams' success. Right. So, you know, I know we opened for him a few times and, and um, you know, like he was, he was getting worldwide success at that point. And it's as if there was only, there was only one record deal to go around. Like most of, most of the records right. deals, from Toronto, or those bands. And so we, we kind of, instead of helping each other, there was, there was this kind of, in the trenches competitive thing that would happen right you know the the doa and the subhumans and all the punk bands would you know like just basically yeah. you know, dismiss us as being mor you know <laughs> uh it, you know just they 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 weren't very kind to us you know and, no. and we thought we were developing better musicianship than they had like the result everybody was kind of competitive but you know i mean you would go and see katie lang and you go oh my god can she sing yeah so she must have been a lot of stuff in vancouver at the time too yeah she was there. she was part of that scene you know for sure yeah because I, I interviewed luke to set and he was talking about the time he spent out that way too with sarah mclaughlin yeah yeah and he still plays with her of course and you know i'm good friends with luke he's a good guy but um yeah and the other thing um i've actually been getting off topic a little bit, but it will circle back to the Vancouver stuff is I've been actually doing a lot of research on some of the cool studios in Canada. Yeah. I found a Facebook group about Le Studio in Morin Heights, Quebec. And yeah. I was, I'm fascinated at the history of that. And then I saw a mini documentary about Little Mountain Sound about Vancouver. And I guess there was a lot of big things happening then as well. And then um, a friend of mine, uh, Dennis Ellsworth here from PEI, 
he recorded his last record at the old Mushroom Studios, which I'm sure you're very familiar with as well. I was in there this week. Oh, really? That's where we recorded. I mean, think of it. Spirit of the West recorded, you know, Home for a Rest was recorded there. Something to Live For was recorded there. Barracuda by Heart. Really? Chill the hits. Um, yeah. You know, Lover Boys, Get Lucky. It was, it ran the whole range. And then, so that room is still going. I'll tell you a story about that room. But first, uh, you know, Little Mountain Sound, we would go in from midnight to four in the morning and the people that were doing the gophers at the studio and would be cleaning the place, right? they would get time engineering and that's how we got in there. So Ron Obvious was the one and he became an amazing technician, but Bob Rock was there. Right. He'd work with Bob Rock and then Mike Fraser who was just like a tape jockey gopher yeah cleanup guy and now you know like acdc you name it and all those people so i love being in that studio and then then when we went to make the record we, we decided we had such an affiliation with little mountain sound but we did mushroom right and mushroom it's a beautiful story because it just it was uh the, the room itself was designed it was it was a custom-made console right by the guy who started at charlie richmond but it was, it had, um, the room was designed, I think, by one of the guys that designed um, some of the great studios in England. Okay. So the room sounds amazing uh, and and still does to this day. So here's the interesting part of late. You know, there's real estate is in such demand there. And then some developer right. bought, bought it. And he was touring through that building. They were probably mm -hmm. thinking of tearing it down. Or do you know this story? I don't. Yeah. And he's, he's touring through the buildings. And he walks into it. They walk in the door and uh, they walk into this room. And he goes, what the hell is this? And they said, well, this is, this was mushroom sound and mushroom, mushroom studios. And then he went home and did research on it. And then he came in the next day and he goes, we can't tear this down. And so yeah. he, he, he looked around for a, an engineer and your friend probably worked with this guy. He's one of the most talented guys I know, John Ram. Okay. He, he looked he looked for somebody where they could have security and a relatively low rent for this room. Right. And so it could continue doing what it's doing. Now, then, then, the, then he took the control room and all the offices and lounges that were there, made it their offices for their engineers and designers. And so John had to put the, there was a storage room and way above the studio, up right. a flight of stairs. And that's where he created the control room. But it didn't really matter because it had, you know, the room itself was there. So that's, and it's still going. I don't know how much longer it'll go. I think it'll go, you know, I, I don't think it's going to last forever. There's going to be too much, you know, it's too valuable a piece of real estate. Little Mountain's not around anymore, is it? I I don't know if the building's there, but, but no, it's, you know, all these things, it was a rehearsal space for a while. Yeah. And I mean, all these storied rooms, it was just so great. I mean, the, but those were the two main ones. There were yeah. other ones, but, but little mountain and mushroom studios and more on Heights. We always wanted to go record there. Right. But we liked kind of what I call adventure recording. Our record ain't life strange. We made at my mom's dad's cottage in house sound. Uh, where we hit, took everything over by a barge yeah and the last record for sony um till tomorrow we recorded in in new mexico which was great so and then and then lonely avenue of course was recorded in los angeles at at the that you know an amazing studio there the george massenberg st studio yeah um i mean the only studio i've ever gotten a tour of is uh metalworks in mississauga because that's where oh, i grew cool. up I grew up there. Um, I was amazed that it wasn't just the studio. Like, I was amazed at the way Triumph was smart enough to have their own lighting and staging and sound company as well. Yeah, yeah. And they, they do were, the they do the school out of there as well. They're really shrewd in that way. Yeah, like I was amazed that it was like I, I I saw the studio and I was saw all the gold records on the wall from people who've recorded there, but I was more amazed at all the equipment that they they rent equipment they they educate people on how to use it and then they hire them. Yeah, to go yeah. out and do like festivals and stuff like that around Ontario and then 
Yeah. I thought, what a great use of it. You know, it's not just depending on the studio. It's got it's more to keep it going. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty, uh, yeah, that was, I mean, a lot of great records. I mean, some of the great Tom Cochran stuff was recorded there, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I read Guns N' Roses recorded there. Tina Turner has yeah. been there. Yeah. Um, obviously Triumph did a lot. I've even read Rush recorded there and everyone made up that yes. big rivalry between Rush and Triumph over the years. Yeah. But there wasn't really a rivalry. I think they were actually friends from what I've heard, but probably. I hear that the documentary on Rush is great. Oh, but on the lighted stage, it's wonderful. Um yeah. I'm actually enjoying a lot of the documentaries that have been coming out. Um I enjoyed the Doug and the Slugs one that I saw recently. I don't know if you saw that. No, but I play with Simon quite often. Uh, he plays. Uh, uh, I should watch that. Where do you where can you get that? I think it's on CBC Gem somewhere, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Um, I remember I talked to Vince from Spirit of the West, and he was disappointed he wasn't in the documentary because he played with Doug and the Slugs for a little while. For my... Oh, he did, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. And he also told me he recorded at the studio with Sue Medley. So. Oh really? Yeah. Wow. So man, talk about a guy that's been around the gambit too. But uh, yeah. And now, he's, now he's an author. <laughs> now he's an author, yeah. Um, I don't think he'll be playing much music anymore, you know. But Yeah, he said he doesn't play at all anymore, but he's still a good friend with Pat from The Odds. and Yeah, well, you know where Pat is now, right? He's with Brian Adams again. Yeah, it's, which is great. Yeah. yeah, I remember him being with Brian Adams back in the 80s, and it was him and Mickey Curry, but I don't know. I think he was back and forth between those two back then. But... Well, it, Mickey Curry um, would record with Brian and then, and then he just really wanted him on the road. Yeah. So it's pretty hard. Like, like Pat, we were talking about it, Pat, you know, Pat's job just got taken by Mickey and then he went. Yeah. And so he went, you know, he just, the odds are certainly, you know, such good friends of mine that right. a great band. And then all of a sudden, you know, Brian has asked him back and all through that time, like, um, Pat never said a bad word about Brian or he was yeah. never, you know, he's just a really wonderful, positive guy. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing some YouTube footage of the last couple of spirit shows at the Commodore. Was it the Commodore? Yeah. yeah. Um, was it the Commodore? I don't remember what I've, well, I've did, never been out West, so I don't know. They did, uh, we did a show um, in support of John, you know, like just raise some money for his family. Yeah. Is that what you were thinking of? With um, no, it was Robinson? they did a line, a, uh, like five shows or something at the end, and John was still singing. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. and had all you guys okay. join him. Yeah, and um, it made me realize the close knit community you guys had among all the musicians out there. Yeah. I mean, even Jim Cuddy was out there, and obviously, you guys have um, Sarah McLaughlin was there. Um, I think a couple of guys from Bare Naked Ladies were there as well. That was the one we did. That was the show we did for John, Spirit of John, or Spirit of, you know, um, uh, and and everybody came out for that. Oh, and you guys re recorded um, Home for a Rest. For yeah. a Rest. I downloaded that off iTunes, actually. Yeah, we so. did it in the bathroom of the Commodore Ballroom. So, <laughs> and then it was a wonderful show, um, you know. Um, I just, I know I felt, I, um, um, I was just an idea I had. It's like, we, we need to support the family. So, yeah. So everybody got behind it and, um, and anybody I called was, yeah, they're in hundred percent. Well, they were one, of, they were probably in my top five favorite bands of all time. And I've seen them over 20 times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and every time I met them, they were always the kindest people I'd ever met. Um, yeah. Vince actually worked it out so I could propose to my wife at one of their shows. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. Still married? We are still married 15 you years. Um, yeah, great. But yeah, that was quite an evening. I was very nervous and I can't believe Vince pulled that off. But he still bugs me about that to this day. It's um, fantastic. Which is kind of fun. Yeah. Like how many times do you get your favorite band to help you out with that? So. Yeah. But um, they are good people. Yeah. definitely um i know one of the songs you did on on this was dedicated yeah. to john yeah um well like was that a hard song to put together because uh well i just you know like uh i it was it was more it was when uh, his wife 
said that he uh, he said that she said that he 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 doesn't one thing is he doesn't dream anymore like that okay. was one phase of it yeah and i that was really impactful for me when i heard that i mean i, I don't yeah. know sometimes there's, there's just something that hits you yeah and um so that that that's where that started from i mean it was just a song about about you know well losing your memory it's like paul hyde that great song of all the things i lost last year oh the one he sang in the documentary oh did he have all the things i lost last year that i missed the my, my mind the most yeah i i actually yeah. shed a tear when i watched that for the first yeah. time and i heard him sing that i was i actually cried a little bit because i thought yeah. that was very yeah. Um, have you seen the documentary on spirit? It's very yes, well done. Yeah, it yeah. was very well done. Yeah. Um, because I was at that Massey Hall show. Yeah. And I'm kind of glad that was I'm I'm happy that was the last show I got to see, yet I'm not. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. But Vince said it was the last time they could really knock it out of the park. Yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, it was great. It was great to see them in Massey Hall because I think that was the first time they'd ever played there. Yeah, I know it was. It was. Did you have you ever played there? Just playing, played with Jim Cuddy. That's that's the only time I I would I'd love playing there. That was just such a fantastic venue. Um, and now you've got a second generation. I actually saw Dustin open for Spirit of the West once. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I bought all of his CDs at the merge table that night. <laughs> so, yeah. um, he's great. I'm. He's going up north to the Arctic with me, and we we play lots together, which is great. Have you ever seen our um, our um, Caribou Express? Any of that stuff? Um, no, I think I've seen clips on YouTube. Um, I thought I saw a clip of you guys doing a Hank Williams song once. Maybe. Why don't I send you a, a, a little? Um, it's a two minute thing that tells the whole story. What What's your email? Al? Um, it's uh, d dot alan a l a n dot dalton. Just a G, D dot Allen. A-L-A-N. Yep. Dot Dalton. At oh. gmail at gmail.com. Yep. At, at gmail? Yes, sir. Is it their dot after Dalton? Yeah. Okay. No, not after Dalton. Not after. Okay. Just I just, at... I'm going to get my pen's now working. Okay. D dot Alan dot Dalton at Gmail. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. I just got an ad sent to me by Q104 in Halifax saying you're playing a show in August there. Yes, the legendary hearts. With the Stampeders, Headpins, and Razor Boy. Yeah. <laughs> and it looks like quite a weekend too. You got Chilliwack there, Haywire, Doug in the Slugs, and Glass yeah. Tiger yeah wow that should be it do you get to spend the whole weekend there or is it just the one day i think i would get to spend the whole weekend there yeah oh that'll be it i think i might have to go <laughs> uh, yeah. it looks like quite the the skip and a jump. yeah um well halifax is about a five-hour drive from here that's not a hop skip and a jump is it but um okay and i have to i'm gonna have to head i've got to head out of the house by well, I can't yeah. thank you enough for joining me today. Oh, no problem. And I'll just send you this clip that tells you about the Caribou Express. Okay. And then I yeah. can get back to you with a link for this. Yeah. Okay. I, appre I appreciate your time. Okay. Thanks so Thanks. much. Uh, great to talk to you. All right. Take care, Brian. Okay. Bye. Bye.